reading from verse 9. Jesus says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I'm going to read now from Psalm 119, which is where, which says, Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your word gives light, it imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep me steady in my steps according to your promise, and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. This is God's word. Let me pray for us and then we're going to talk about the next part of the Lord's prayer. Father, um, your commandments are so good. Your will is good. And Lord, so often we don't see it that way. Um, I pray that now as we look at your word together, you'd help us to desire uh, more and more what you desire, to love what you love, uh, and to, and to honour Jesus in our lives. Amen. Well, this evening we are continuing. I'm just going to move the stand. We are continuing and we're getting towards the end of um, our year-long series in the Heidelberg Catechism emotional times and um, we're in a mini series uh, looking at the Lord's Prayer and um, we're looking at it line by line because we want to learn how to pray this is the prayer that Jesus taught us so we're going to learn how to pray together as we look at it and we're coming now towards the end of the first half of the Lord's Prayer and one thing that struck me as we've looked at it together is that the first half of the Lord's Prayer is all about God. I don't know about you, but sometimes I come to prayer and I treat it a bit like a shopping list. I'm a bit tired, I've had a rough day, I come to the end of the day, I sit down, bash through my Bible reading, and I'm like, oh, it's nearly time to go to sleep. God, I want this, I want this, I want this, pray for this, please help this person, thank you very much, thanks for your doing, good night, amen. And that's kind of my prayer life sometimes. Don't know about you, I wonder if you've prayed a prayer like that recently. Perhaps prayer looks a bit like this to you. The Lord's Prayer shows us and reminds us that prayer is first and foremost an act of worship. It's to focus our hearts on God and the Lord's Prayer helps us to put God back in his rightful place. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done. And I reckon if any of the lines of the Lord's Prayer we've looked at so far puts God back in his rightful place, it's this line we're, we're focusing on today. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So without further ado, let's read the Heidelberg Catechism question for this evening. Question 122. What does the third request mean? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven means help us and all people to reject our own wills and to obey your will without any backtalk. Your will alone is good. Help us one and all to carry out the work we are called to as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. Before we go on, I want us just to think for two minutes about what God's will is. Because there's a couple of ways it's used in the Bible. The first way is talking about God's fixed plans and purposes for the world. So in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, it talks about how um, God works everything according to the counsel of his will. And you've got verses like Isaiah 46, verses 10 and 11, which talk about how God's purpose will stand. And he will do the things he has planned. 
There's a sense in which God's will, because he is sovereign and all-knowing and all-powerful, his will does not change. His plans are fixed and they cannot be stopped. His plans for time and for salvation. But there's another sense which the Bible speaks of God's will. And, and that's sometimes called his will of command or his will of desire. For instance, the Ten Commandments, God commands and wills that, that no one murders and that no one envies. But yet we do this again and again and again. So as we pray, your will be done, we are praying that we would more, walk more and more in God's ways. We're praying that he, we would follow his commands and we're praying that our desires would fall in line with what he desires for our lives. The angels in heaven give God perfect, ceaseless praise and worship and obedience and adoration. And that is why Jesus calls us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And there's three particular things that the, the catechism highlights tonight. That gets to the heart of what it means to pray, your will be done. That helps us to understand what we're praying for when we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The first thing we're praying for is that we would reject our own wills. The second thing is that we would trust God's will. And the third thing is that we would carry out God's will. Reject our own wills, trust God's will, and carry out God's will. So firstly, we're praying that we would reject our own wills. Why would we want to pray that? In the 21st century, where we're, we're, we're very proud of what all that man's achieved, why would we reject our own will and desire? I've got two reasons for you. The first one is God's position, and the second one is for our protection. So firstly, we want to reject our own wills because of God's position. And by that, I basically mean that we want to reject our own wills because God is God and we are not. He makes the rules and we don't. I've got a couple of analogies to help us to think this through. The first one is when you go to a new country, when you cross the border, you have to obey the rules of the land. So for instance, if you drive a car in France, you've got to put the little emergency kit in the back, you've got to have a high, high vis vest to hand, you've got to put the weird stickers on your lights, which kind of change the way they face, I don't really understand it, and you've got to drive on the opposite side of the road. The reason you do that is because you're in their country, so you obey their rules. We live in God's world. It belongs to him, and therefore it's his job to make the rules and tell us how to live. That's the first reason we should respect God's position. The second analogy to help us think this through um, is Nando's. Now, I could talk about Nando's all day, so I'm going to try and keep this fairly brief. But you can now make homemade Nando's. This is quite exciting to me when I first heard about this. Um, you can buy all the sauces and all the ingredients um, from the supermarket and take it home, cook it yourself. That's what homemade means, if you didn't know. Um, but the thing is, homemade Nando's is never quite what you want. It always falls short a little bit. It never matches up to the real thing. To, if you want the real thing, if you want a proper Nando's experience, if you want the best form of Nando's, you have to go to the restaurant. You have to go to the people that make Nando's. You have to go to the creator. They do Nando's best because they made it. So they know how to do it best. And friends, it's a simple argument, but God created life. God created you and me. And so he knows the way it works best. He knows how to do it best. He's the creator. So if you want... The proper experience of life. If you want to do life well, you need to go to God and find out how it's done and experience it from him. We reject our wills because of God's position, that he is Lord and he is creator. But we also want to pray that we would reject our wills for our own protection. And this has been, um, this has struck me this week. Because often I, I, I think about these kind of things and I think, oh, God's been a bit of a killjoy. I just want to do what I want to do. But actually, every line of the Lord's Prayer flows from the first line, our Father in heaven. So when we pray, your will be done, that is 
an expression of God's fatherhood. And in praying this, God is offering us a chance to be protected from ourselves. He, it protects us in a general way in that, I guess, what kind of world would this be if there was, if God didn't give us his will, if, didn't, if God didn't tell us how to live? How much more dangerous would this world be if we didn't have God's commandments and he hadn't given us consciences? By God's grace, we're not nearly as bad as we, we could be. But also, it, this is a personal protection. An old theologian called Martin Luther argues that when we pray your will be done, we're committing ourselves to God. And so being protected from our own character and our own feelings. So for example, if someone wrongs you, if someone really hurts you, there'll be something within you that really wants to get your own back, that really wants to take revenge, that really wants to be angry and really wants to hurt that person. God invites us to pray your will be done as an alternative to bitterness and resentment. He offers us to give ourselves to his way. When we lo would love to take revenge, God offers us the chance to pray your will be done and forgive instead. Praying your will be done is letting go rather than clinging on to bitterness and resentment. And becoming despondent and hardened. It's saying, I'm going to do things God's way. And in that sense, it's, it's a protection from ourselves. When we pray your will be done, we're praying we would reject our own wills. But we're also placing our trust in God's will. We're praying and, and acknowledging that God's plans are good. Now, it's easy to know that as a fact. When we sung Servant King earlier, Sarah said it's easy to, to, to say these words. But it's much more difficult to do them. And it's much more difficult to know that God's plans are good as, a, as, a, as an experience. And to really cling to that. One thing I, I, off, I struggle to understand about Beth, um, even though we've been married for a few years now, is just how much she enjoys eating salad like when she has, the, she, she just, there's something about the green, eating green leaves and a few peppers and a bit of mayonnaise that she really enjoys. And so she eats them regularly and, and, she, and she's healthy because of it. But when I eat salad, I just think it's a bit of a chore. I think it's just, I mean, I'm just eating these green leaves and I know it's a good thing to do, but I really don't want to do this. I would take a burger every day of the week. I reckon loads of us treat God's will, God, what God wants us to do, a little bit like eating a salad. A little bit like I treat eating a salad. We know it's the good thing to do. We know it's the right thing to do. But actually, sometimes I'd just rather do what I want to do. We would do well to take the example of David in Psalm 119. We, I read it at the beginning for us. But I'm going to, just going to take it through a few more of these verses again. So Psalm 119, reading from verse 129. David says that God's testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your word gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. And then reading from verse 135, Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. David here longs for God's commandments. He longs to do God's will. He says they are wonderful. He says God's commandments are bring light to the simple. And when that he sees that they're not done, he says he sheds tears. He's broken when he sees God's will not being done. Don't know about you, but this is a, a fairly alien experience for me quite a lot of the time. 
So how do we get to the stage where we're, we're more like David, where we're more up for um, God's will, where we delight in God's will, where we, um, where we shed tears when we see it not being done? Well, for a moment, just imagine a world where everyone perfectly lived by God's will, where everyone followed God's desires. Imagine a world where everyone perfectly kept the Ten Commandments. Imagine a world where everyone worshipped God in unity and and were part of one big family. Imagine a world where children honoured their parents perfectly. I feel like I've got the attention of of parents now. Um, Imagine a world even bigger than that, where there's no broken relationships, where everyone treats each other with respect and dignity. Imagine a world that is completely safe, where there's no danger of walking down the street and having your stuff stolen, or leaving your house and having your stuff stolen, or where there's no danger of of murder. Imagine a world where you can completely trust everyone, that is full of truth and goodness. Imagine a world where you can rest from feeling jealous, from looking at someone else's life and going, oh, I want what they've got, they're they're amazing and I'm rubbish. Imagine a world where you're free and full full of peace and full of delight in God. When I stop and think about that, when I stop and think about what God's will is looking to achieve, I go, yeah, your will be done. Your will be done. Is this a pipe dream? It's easy to look at the world and think, oh, does, does God really want this will to be done? Does, what is God really doing about it? Can we, can we actually trust him to bring this stuff about? What's he doing to bring about a world like this? Well, the answer to all those questions is found in a garden 2,000 years ago. We've already sung about it. There in the garden of tears, my heavy load he chose to bear. His heart with sorrow was torn, yet not my will, but yours, he said. The Son of God, under more crushing circumstances than any of us will ever experience. He bowed to the Father's will. We sung about that too. And he died on the cross to save us and to pay for the times where I have not followed his will, where you have not followed his will, where the times where we've gone, God, thanks very much, but I just want to do what I want to do. Jesus died to buy our forgiveness. And that shows that this hope this world, this perfect world that I just kind of painted a picture of, that's not a pipe dream. Jesus has brought hope for us that one day we will be with God in a perfect relationship with him and with each other. So we can trust him because he's acted in this world to bring us hope. And we can also trust him because he doesn't ask us to do anything he's not willing to do himself. Surely the kind of saviour, the kind of king that's willing to give up his life, a servant king, is the kind of king that, that you'd want to follow. God doesn't just sit there on his big throne and say, you guys get on and do my will and I'm just going to sit here and chill. No, he goes, says, I'm going to come down and, and, and save you and get you and I'm going to bring you into my, my family and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this hope. And he says, will you pray? Your will be done. Will you live for me? This is why it's worth trusting God's will. We pray that we would reject our own wills. We pray that we would trust God's will. And the last thing we're praying for when we pray your will be done is that we would carry out God's will. Remember the prayer is not your will be trusted. It's not your will be loved. Though we have to do those things. The prayer is your will be done can't do God's will without trusting God's will. Romans 8 says, those who are in the flesh, those who don't trust God, they can't please God. But if we truly trust God, then we will want to do his will. We will want to serve him. So friends, can I invite you this evening to pray that God would help us to do his will, that God would would change us and transform us to walk in his ways. That's what David prays for in Psalm 119 we've already seen that he delights in God's will but he also acknowledges that he needs God's help to keep it in verse 133 
He says, keep steady my steps according to your promise and let no iniquity get dominion over me. We've seen that David delights in God's will, but here we're seeing some acknowledgement that it will be a struggle to keep God's will. He needs God's help. He needs to pray to God in order to, to, to follow God's commands. He knows it's going to be a battle. If he doesn't battle, then sin will get dominion over him. So when we pray your will be done, we're praying for that. We're praying that God would help us struggle with sin, help us fight the fight of faith, help us to, to, to die to our own desires, to say no to ourselves and yes to what God wants for us. It would be way easier, wouldn't it, if God just kind of took out our own wills and put his will in. Then it would be easy to obey God. But the thing is, that's not how God works. God doesn't just want to make us into robots that kind of follow his will willy-nilly. He wants to make us into children who do life together. And as we grow up, we take on more and more of our Father's likeness. We love what he loves. We hate what he hates. And we desire what he desires. This is the way God works. He wants to change us and transform us so that we are like him. So as, as we come to a close, I guess the warning is that if you pray your will be done and, and you mean it, then God will change you. God will, God will transform you. This isn't a prayer we can pray lightly because as we pray these, this prayer, we're praying the words of Jesus. And so as we pray this prayer, when we're committing to follow the pattern of Jesus, to follow the life of Jesus. We're, we're saying, God, I want to say no to my desires. I want to put my desires second, and I want to put you front and center of my life. I'm saying, God, your will be done. And that might mean saying no to comfort. That might mean saying I'm going to risk being rejected by a friendship group to, in order to speak about my faith. That might mean I'm going to risk uh, not... Uh, getting that promotion at work because actually I put some time in serving at church rather than working 24-7. It might mean all sorts of things. I wonder what you need, what's going on in your life where you need to pray your will be done. Is there something you need to change? Is there something that you're clinging on to that you need to just say, your will be done and surrender to God. If, you, if you're struggling to do that, would you look to Jesus who in the garden of tears prayed, not my will, but yours be done. And he died for me and you. This is the call of a disciple to follow Jesus in that, to trust him even when times are tough, to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And the Bible says that is the way to life. That's the way to life now and it's the way to that hope we talked about earlier. Will you follow Jesus? Will you follow Jesus to deny yourself and say no to yourself and yes to God? And will you follow him into eternity? If that is the destination of people who are willing to pray, your will be done. Let me pray for us now as we finish um, and then we're going to sing a song that helps us unpack a bit more what your will be done means Father I reckon there's loads of us who have prayed this prayer lots of times we've sat in school and we've, we've prayed your kingdom come your will be done help us to be a, pr a more prayerful people and help us to pray regularly that we would reject our own wills that we would trust in God's will and we would carry out your will. Would you change us and transform us ultimately to be like Jesus? Would you help us and, and give us strength to do that? I pray for anyone here who, who, who wants to pray that prayer now. Would you help us to pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Amen.